Okay. Today we're going to combine the idea of what we've been doing with stress, the axial stress, and this new thing called strain. So we'll talk about that. Um, you do have web work. Number one, homework one is due tonight. So uh, you got a little more time to work on it. Then homework two is due tomorrow night. So they start piling up now. So don't wait too long to work on those things. Um, let's move over to, where did I put it? There. Let's minimize that. Um, first, let's talk about strain, the idea of strain. So we don't need this picture just yet. Let's get it out of the way. So stress and strain, we've been doing topics related to stress, so particularly axial stress. Sometimes we call it normal stress, uh, meaning that the surface that this stress occurred on was normal or perpendicular to the force that was causing the stress. Um, we're still going to stick with axial ideas right now. So um, axial is still a key part with the forces being applied along a longitudinal axis. Um, but we're going to talk about axial strain for a little bit. And we're going to, axial is going to be the same definition. It's going to be that there's a force applied along some kind of longitudinal axis of the part that we're dealing with. Uh, strain is a new thing. And we're going to say that strain is the severity of deformation. And that just means that something has deformed, it's changed shape. And since we're talking about axial strain, the deformation is a change in length. So it either got longer if we pulled on it, or it got shorter if we uh, pushed on it. <clears throat> so in our case, the deformation is a change in length. Um, we are, you know, obviously there's conservation of mass. So if I pull on something and make it longer, then somewhere it had to get skinnier. Uh, and that is true, and it does happen. Uh, we're not taking that into account in any of our calculations. So there are other things that happen whenever you stretch something where it does have to get thinner somewhere. Um, if it's maintained the same amount of mass, if you didn't add any mass to it, but you made it longer, then somewhere it had to get smaller. Um, and we'll look at that, but we're not going to calculate any of that. So this, this kind of assumes that the cross section uh, stays the same size, even if we stretch the thing out you know, 10 feet or whatever. We're not going to stretch stuff that far, but um, we're going to assume that there's no change in cross-sectional area, even though there has to be somewhere. We're going to assume there's not any. Um, so again, we're making kind of these um, uh, assumptions that make our equations not quite as realistic as they could be, but they're useful for what we need them to do. Um, so the equation for axial strain, we're going to use, uh, this is epsilon, so Greek letter, Epsilon and uh, we're going to say that Epsilon axial strain equals the final length of the thing you know so we measured how long it is after we stretch it we're going to subtract off the original length of the thing so wherever it started before we started stretching it and divide by the original length so you can see it's just a percent change it's, or if we multiply by 100% it would just be a percent change and it's unitless. We, we have units of inches or meters or something in the numerator, and we have the same units in the denominator. So it doesn't have units on it. Uh, it is uh, sometimes, though, expressed as a percent. So you might see percent strange strain. Uh, a lot of times you might also see this written as delta. So the final length minus the initial length is just collapsed into delta or change as per delta change in length over original length. Uh, and sometimes you won't see the L naught, it'll just be L, and you have to know that that's the original length of the thing. <clears throat> so that's pretty straightforward. So, for instance, we might have a little bar, and it's got, I don't know, some, uh, one, two, three, four, five, let's say six, let's make it feet, six feet long bar. 
and we apply some force to it, axial force. This one is shown as tension. The arrows are pointing away from the body, so it's a tensile force, making it longer. Um, so that's the initial state. Maybe right now F equals zero because we're not actually applying any force and stretching it. And then we decide, oh, we do need to apply some force to it. And it stretches out now. It is uh, six and a half feet long. And we've applied, you know, some force. F is not zero. F is greater than zero. I don't know what it actually is, but it's greater than zero. Um, to calculate the strain here, all we do is strain is the final length, six and a half feet, minus the initial length, six feet, over the original length, six feet. So we end up with uh, half a foot for our delta and six feet for original length. There's where the feet would cancel out and it would be a unitless uh, term. And our strain would be 0 0.083. Or we could express that as a percent, just move the decimal over and express it as a percent if we wanted to. Um, so this is, you know, kind of a reasonable number. It's actually kind of large. You wouldn't really expect a, a six inch stretch on something that's six feet long. That's kind of extreme. Um, most materials aren't going to be able to handle that kind of change in length before something else happens to them. So just because you can calculate a strain doesn't mean that the part itself could sustain that strain. You know, it would, it, chances are if you stretch a six foot bar by six inches that it's probably going to break some other way. Um, but we're ignoring that part. Um, but notice that I didn't even say anything about how big the diameter, you know, the cross-sectional area. We didn't even really talk about that. Obviously, it affects the amount of strain, though. If this thing is 10 foot diameter versus uh, well, a tenth of an inch diameter, that would definitely affect how much it's going to stretch. We didn't talk about the material. You know, is it steel or rubber? We didn't talk about how much force is. I just said it's greater than zero. So all of those things affect strain, but they don't actually go in the strain equation. You know, the only thing in the strain equation is these lengths, final length and initial length. Um, so there's got to be some connection between this stress that would occur in here that talks about the part failing uh, and stretching and this strain that talks about it just stretching. And what happens is here's another one of our little videos. Um, this is a different one not our video, it's someone else's video, but um, this is the tensile test. So we don't actually need to listen to it, but uh, here's a test specimen. This is probably like three inches long, maybe four inches long, and you might can pick up, mm, you can probably see it right now, if I can make it pause, how the, it's dark on the screen up there, but um, how the middle section of this is starting to get thinner. So there's that thinner part that we're not actually dealing with, but we're making it longer, so somewhere it had to get thinner. And normally, it localizes this part where it gets thinner instead of like the whole thing getting thinner. It's local to some area. Um, typically, that area is near the center, but uh, it's not specifically in the center all the time, um, particularly if there's some uh, material fault somewhere else in the part, you know, then wherever it's weakest is where it's going to get thinner. Um, but here it's stretching out and uh, it's getting thinner. Let's run it a little longer uh, and it's getting even more thin. And now you can clearly see that it has net, created a little neck area there and it fractures. That is a tensile test that's typical of, you know, how you determine material properties and how you relate this idea of strain because it got longer stress because it broke at some point. So what happens is you collect this data. Let's get some room here. So all the while that you're um, running this test or one of those tests like that, and you will, lab one is doing one of those tests on, on a different material. Um, ductile materials, you obviously like steel, that was steel. Um, you obviously get a lot more stretching than you will on a more brittle material. Your material is going to be an engineered wood, so it's going to be um, much more brittle than it is ductile, but it will 
perform the same idea. So the whole time that you're doing that test, you're measuring, collecting data on two particular things. One of them would be uh, basically delta. You know, there's up above the screen, what you couldn't see on the little video is above there, there's some crosshead that's gradually moving up at some given rate, an inch per minute or half an inch per minute or whatever they've set the thing to. And you're collecting that data. So you're collecting how far the thing is stretched. Basically, it started out at some point and you moved it up. Um, so you're collecting data and one of them would be how far is it moved. And then in the also on that crosshead is a what's called a load cell and a load cell measures force. And you're collecting that data. too. So you have some force data. And if you plot these, you get a graph. I'm going to have to exaggerate it because uh, depending on the particular material, the first part of this graph might be really close to vertical. Uh, and we couldn't really see much. So I'm going to exaggerate the slope here or make it less vertical and say it's more like this. And then it's going to do something like this. And then it breaks. Now, this is force and delta change in length. But those are really close. If I take that force and divide by my original area, remember it does get thinner. And I'm not, some, there are some versions of these tests, the video test where you recalculate that area as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then our graph doesn't have this hump in it. it you know, it keeps going up um, because what if I take the force that I measure divide by the original area or the, the area as it changes, then that is stress, right? Because stress is force divided by area. So the, my y axis is now actually stress. Um, and if I keep the original area, like it's a half inch diameter or so on these tests, it's depending on what kind of machine you're dealing with and what you're testing, but somewhere in that range um, versus if I take and recalculate the area, remeasure the area every time it changes, then the graph looks a little bit different, but either way, it's still a stress number. And then the denominator, if I take the delta and divide by the original length, the, which is called in this term a gauge length, Sometimes there's a U engaged, depending on if you want to spell it with a U or not. Um, then that term, delta over L naught, is strain. So what I've created is a stress strain plot. So, oops, don't want that to happen. And it gives me a two big regions here, one that's linear, you can see that first section is more or less a straight line, and the one, one that's not linear, the uh, second part is curved. And these two regions kind of broadly get defined at some point, yeah, maybe, you know, right, let's say right here. There's some point where we exit what's called the elastic region, so this part down here that's straight, that's going to be the elastic region. So we'll call that this point that I have kind of arbitrarily defined here. That would be the uh, proportional limit. I just kind of picked the point on the line where it looked maybe not linear anymore not straight anymore. So we could have all picked different points there. And I happened to pick that one because it lined up with the grid. So that's what I did. Um, we need a better way, which we'll get in a second. But uh, this little section down here is all what we would call the elastic region. And that's where in general, we want our parts to operate because this is the point where uh, we're stretching out bonds between atoms in the material, in this crystal structure. Um, we're doing things like that, but we're not actually moving atoms around. If I start moving atoms around, it'll never go back to its original shape. So this is the region where I want my parts generally to operate. Sometimes I send my part outside of this region before it's in service to harden it, to work harden it. 
Um, but in general, once the part's in service, I want it to stay in this region, the elastic region, because if I apply a force or a strain or a stress to it, I want it to go back to its original shape. I don't want it to be permanently deformed uh, because it chances are it won't do what I originally intended it to do. So if that's the elastic region, then all of this, you know, all of this part, that's going to be the plastic region. And so that part is, I have exceeded the yield strength. So on that chart with material properties, we'll have to look at it again. But uh, we had an elastic strength that right now I don't have an elastic strength. I have what's called a proportional limit, kind of where I think it's no longer linear. Um, we'll get an elastic strength in a second. Um, and then I had uh, above that elastic strength, I had permanent changes in shape. So if I strain the part to the point where I've, I've created, you know, it exists somewhere up here, then I'm no longer in the elastic region. I'm in this nonlinear region and I have permanent uh, changes in atom position. So there's slip planes or something where atoms have changed position relative to one another versus just stretching out their atomic bonds. Uh, and that sometimes is good, like I said, for work hardening, making the part stronger, um, but I generally don't want to do that while it's in service. I want to do that before it goes into service. So we will probably not want to exist in this plastic region. But there is one point here, this peak, that we might want to pay attention to. This peak, if I read it off of the graph over here, this is sigma u, the ultimate strength of the material. If I see that point, that's where, so see how the graph starts turning downward? Uh, that's the point in the video where there's a real neck form, so the area got smaller and smaller. Uh, and if at that point, it's probably going to continue on to fail. If I keep the same amount of force on there, but the area is getting smaller and smaller, then the stress is going to continue to increase. This graph doesn't show it because I am <laughs> dividing by the original area versus that decreasing area. Um, if I divided by the decreasing area, this part of the graph would go upwards really quick, right? Um, so that's the ultimate strength. If I get to that point, I'm probably just going to end up with fracture. Um, so what I'm interested in is a, a consistent way to get what we call the yield strength, or your book had listed as elastic strength. So... The proportional limit's kind of good, except that every one of us might pick a slightly different point. So what typically happens is you define an amount of strain that you're happy with. And um, one number, actually, let's go and look at our, our material properties and see what number they use. Uh, let's see, where's that at? So we had, in this resources tab, we had reference materials and we had a chart of material properties. So let's open that. And down here at the bottom, uh, let's see, elastic strength may be represented by a proportional limit, that's the one where we just kind of guess, yield point where it looks like it's uh, really yielding, or yield strength at a specified, at off, specified offset. That's what we want to do, because that's the one where we can all get the same number. Um, usually 0.2% for ductile metals. So that's talking about 0.2% strain. So what it says is that, uh, in general, my part is okay if it has 0.2% strain in it. So a change in length or deformation of 0.2%. That's not too much that it's going to affect the way that my part behaves when it's in service. Um, other numbers sometimes get put in here, 0.5% uh, or maybe 0.05. I don't have to remember now. Um, but our numbers are going to be 0.2%. So how you do that is we go back over to our chart. Here it is. You would go down to 0.2%. Remember, strain can sometimes be represented as a percent. So you find 0.2%. Now, it's not going to be that far over on the uh, graph. I'm having to exaggerate things to make them visible. Um, 
obviously 0.2% is much closer to zero than what I drew. Um, and the line, the linear portion line is much more vertical in normal materials. But what I do is I go down, find that amount of strain, and then I draw a line that's parallel to this linear region, as best I can, maybe I use a ruler, and then I get this point. And if I read that stress, that is the yield strength. And we would all end up at the same point because we all went to 0.2% strain and that was a acceptable amount of strain. We all drew the same parallel line and intersected the graph at the same point. And so we'd all get the same value for sigma y. Whereas a proportional limit, we might all, you know, maybe we could do some algorithms that, oh, it's really not linear anymore uh, and get pretty close to the same number. Uh, but this way, we will certainly get the same value for yield strength. So sometimes this is called the 0.2% offset yield strength. So sigma y that I've drawn here is the 0.2% offset yield strength. Um, and again, it's not going to be that far into the curved, you know, nonlinear part of the graph. I'm having to exaggerate stuff to make it visible. Um, but that's the process that would happen. Um, so now we have a number for our elastic strength. We have a number for our ultimate strength. We have, if we want it, you know, we could read down here and get the strain at fracture. So just how much did it stretch before it fractured? It's not terribly useful, but... Um, Sometimes it's useful to know your limit. Uh, you really don't want to get to that limit, obviously. Um, I have my elastic region where I want the part to operate. I have this plastic region where I have permanent deformation. And, um, you, you know, depending on the, the classes you've taken, you will or you have or you are taking a class that describes how this material properties work and how the work hardening works and all that kind of stuff. Um, and depending on your major. Um, but in general... This graph is called the engineering stress strain plot. Because we stuck with A0, we didn't go back and recalculate the original uh, or, or recalculate the current area. But there is a true stress strain plot where uh, A equals the actual uh, cross sectional area. So there's, you know, there's a A T basically it changes over time. <clears throat> and then the, the graph would look a little bit different. The parts of it that we would be interested in are still the same. But um, so normally engineers don't b bother to look at the uh, actual the true stress strain, stress strain plot, because uh, at that point where you've actually had that amount of deformation, the parts not good for you to use anymore. So normally we're not looking at that part. Um, now what we were trying to do though, is how does this strain relate to stress? And this graph like explicitly says there's stress on the Y axis and there's strain on the X axis. And uh, so they're related together. And if I really want the part to stay in this elastic region, then the relationship between the two of them is a straight line. So right here in the linear part, I could say that, you know, there's a slope right here where the rise is what I'm going to call E and the run is one. So that would create a, and, and E is a, a term we haven't talked about yet. It's called the modulus of elasticity, but um, in this case, it's the slope of the line. So um, if you know the equation of a straight line is y equals m times x plus b, so m is the slope, b is the y-intercept, then y-axis is sigma. Uh, the slope, the way I've defined it here, is e over 1, rise over run, is e over 1, so e. Uh, x, the x-axis is epsilon, so strain. Uh, and B, the y-intercept, we intercept y at zero because when we have no strain, we have no stress. 
So that would be the equation. Sigma equals E times epsilon. This is Hooke's law, and it relates stress to strain in the linear part of the uh, curve here. Uh, in more general, it's talking about springs. You know, uh, they don't have to be literal spring coil springs, but uh, the change in length for an amount of uh, stress that's applied to something or force that's applied to something. Here we've kind of hidden the force inside the stress. Um, so this guy, Robert Hook, this is, well, this is not actually him. This is a picture of a, that was created based on description of him. There's no, there's no actual pictures of him or no paintings of him. He was around in the 17, well, barely in the 1700s, mostly in the 1600s. Uh, and he has several of this type of um, laws associated with them, with this idea of stressing and straining and that sort of thing. And Hooke's law is how we're going to relate these two things together. Um, let's see. So let's let's combine these things. We know from a couple of days ago that stress is force over area. So that was the intensity of internal forces. If that number got too big, then things broke. Um, or things stretch, you know, you get into the nonlinear or the plastic region. Um, so we had that equation. We just had this equation of strain, epsilon equals delta over the original length of the part. Um, and so that just gives us a measure of uh, the severity of the deformation is either a percent or a decimal. Uh, and then we just saw this idea of Hooke's law that relates sigma is E times epsilon. And again, E, this is the slope of that linear region, and it's called the modulus of elasticity. And it would be in these charts over here. Let's see if I can find one. So they have that column modulus of elasticity right there. Now it has odd units in this particular chart. The units are thousands of KSI. So that's million PSI. Um, so it's numbers like uh, for that structural steel, that generic steel that we have been using, 29,000 KSI. So 29 million PSI. Um, so they're really big numbers, um, meaning that the slope of this line that we just drew is Pretty steep. Um, other materials have a little bit, you know, there's some cast iron. That's a brittle material. Uh, it has a lower modulus of elasticity. Um, there's some even lower numbers in the aluminum. Uh, there's a really low number in magnesium. Um, there's some wood materials with, you know, tiny numbers. Um, so this modulus of elasticity, that is the term E. Um, there's one here, modulus of rigidity, so don't confuse that one. Uh, we'll talk about that one a little bit later. Modulus of rigidity is the same idea, except instead of stretching the part, you twist the part. Um, and we're not ready for twisting things yet, so we're not going to worry with it yet. All right, so I've got these three equations, and they all are talking about the same thing. I've applied a force to a body, and it's stretched, it's strained, uh, it is stressed. Uh, and they, so these all relate together. So if I take and substitute um, x sigma and epsilon into Hooke's law, then I get sigma is f over a. So well, here is Hooke's law: sigma equals e times epsilon, F over A for sigma. And uh, technically, that's, remember, the, the A naught here, but uh, we won't worry with that. We're, we're going to assume that we don't uh, track the changing area, cross-sectional area of things. Um, e is modulus of uh, elasticity, and that is a material property that we will typically look up in a chart similar to the one we just looked at. Um, are exactly like the one we just looked at. Epsilon is 
uh, defined as that change in length over the original length. And again, um, a lot of times that naught, the L is zero, will just be L. And it's understood that the length we're talking about is the original length. Um, so this combination, if we solve it for uh, delta, then I would have delta equals F times L, and I, I'm going to drop the naught off of there, over um, E times A. So I've got a force and the original length in the numerator, and I've got the uh, material property E and the geometry, the cross-section A in the denominator. Um, easy way to remember this thing is that you know, F, L, E, A. So it's like a flea. Uh, it doesn't work so well when I write the F as a P because sometimes you use your axial forces labeled as P then it's some kind of thing that looks like plea. So it doesn't always work that way. So maybe a flea or flea, whichever flea you like. Let's get them sliding down. So this thing we can use to calculate delta, so a change in length, if we're given the uh, force, the how long the part is, uh, what material it's made of, and something about its geometry, so we can calculate its cross-sectional area. Um, so this might show up, actually, I think, let's come back, because I think I already drew a picture here. Yeah, I did. Let's say that we've got a little steel one inch by one inch bar sitting on a five inch by five inch block of aluminum and we've got some forces applied to it. So I've got a 5,000 pound tensile force applied to the steel and, and we're going to assume, I didn't actually point this out, but these are, these are welded together. You know, there's, they're not going to come apart. So there's some kind of weld there that's keeping these things stuck together. Um, normally you don't weld steel to aluminum. In our imaginary world, we did, though. So somehow we did that. Um, here's an example of a distributed load. So I've got a whole bunch of arrows. Um, I'm just trying, again, to show that this force is evenly spread out or evenly distributed on top of the aluminum block pushing down on it. Uh, and the total of it is 8,000 pounds. You don't literally, when, the, when all the arrows are connected together, uh, then you don't go put 8,000 for every individual arrow. Uh, at least the way I draw these diagrams. Um, if you had individual arrows labeled 8,000 pounds, then yes, each one represents a separate 8,000 pound force. Um, here, this is one 8,000 pound force that's spread out um, and it's pushing on the aluminum block. So uh, this is another one of the uh, setups where drawing the free body diagram is going to be important. Uh, because you can get confused on what the internal, this F, remember this F in the delta equation, it came from the stress equation. And we were very specific when talking about the stress equation that the force was the internal force. So that F is still the internal force. It's not the external forces. So maybe if we draw a side view of this thing, we can uh, better draw some free body diagrams. We've got to get some room though. And there's a little section of our material properties. All right, so let's draw a real quick side view. It's five inches tall aluminum block and four inch tall steel block. So just do it this way. One, two, three, four for the steel. And they're actually like this. It is not super important that we draw it all to scale, but sometimes it helps. Um, we have, this force was 5,000 pounds here. And this one, again, it was distributed across here and it was a total of 8,000 pounds pushing downward. Now in the picture I drew up there, it, it's just shown on sitting on this blob Again, the blobs, the crosshatch blobs are just 
parts that we aren't considered. They're kind of indestructible. Um, but here, when I draw it as kind of a free body diagram, I can't have it floating in space, uh, accelerating in one direction. Right now it would accelerate, right? Um, because I have unbalanced forces. So I need to balance out my forces. So I need to um, push back upwards a little more. I need to add 3,000 pounds going up to make this thing not accelerate downward. Um, so now I've got a total of 8,000 pointing upwards and a total of 8,000 pointing down. It's balanced uh, and it's in equilibrium. All right, so there's other dimensions that we will refer back to over here, but uh, I won't put them on here for now. So when we are trying to calculate the total change in length, let's assume that's what we're trying to do. Find, so we're given this stuff and some more data like material and dimensions. We're going to find the total change in length. All right. So this case, whenever we're trying to apply this equation, FL over EA, then I have to have FL, E, and A all constant. So I had oftentimes in a problem like this, I have to define two separate regions or more separate regions. They don't they won't necessarily just be one region. I've got the steel. Remember, this part is steel. And this part's aluminum. I've got the steel region where I've got a constant material, steel. Got a constant cross-sectional area that was one inch by one inch. Uh, I've got a constant force applied. Uh, we'll have to look and see what that force is. But I've got a constant force and, um, well, it's a length, the length of the steel piece. But then everything changes, not everything, but uh, a lot changes when I get to the aluminum. I've got a different material, so as soon as I change that, then I would have to create a new region. Uh, or I've got a different force, so I would have to create a different region. Um, a different geometry, you know, it went from one inch by one inch to five inches by five inches square for the cross section. So uh, any one of those would force me to create a separate region. And anytime one of my variables changes, then I have to create a separate region. This one only needs two regions, a steel region, and an aluminum region, but I have to analyze them separately, then add them together. So um, for the steel region, remember when you want to draw your free body diagram, you kind of go in the middle of the region and cut it open. And we'll call this delta one. So this or, or one region will be steel. And we draw our little free body diagram. We cut it open here and we had 5,000 pounds of external tensile force and I would have 5,000 pounds of internal tensile force. So F1 equals 5,000 pounds and it's tension pointing away from the little body I drew. So that means it's positive. Um, it's going to start being important for these problems to keep up with which ones are positive, and which ones are negative, because if I want to add them together, then some of them might be negative. Some of them might be positive. I need to keep up with positive and negative. Um, L1, I'm trying to write this equation, right? Delta 1 equals F1, L1, E1, and A1. So I found F1, positive 5,000 pounds. L1, uh, some people get this a little bit confused, you know, because they cut the free body diagram open and they want to say, well, L1 must be, you know, what this is, whatever this length is. But that's not what we're talking about. Um, when you cut the you're not redefining the length of it. You're just trying to see what's going on inside of it. So the length of L1 is the length of section one, which according to this picture was four inches. So the original length is four inches. It is steel. Uh, so I need to go over here to my little material properties and I'm looking for modulus of elasticity. And steel, I've got a lot of steels here, right? I've got all of these. Um, and they do have different modulus of elasticity. So technically, I'd need to be a little more specific. Am I talking this generic structural steel? Uh, do I mean one of these uh, with a certain percentage of carbon in it? Is it hot rolled? Is it hardened? All this kind of stuff. Um, 
And there's even some stainless steels down there with very uh, with a little bit different numbers. So in a problem on an exam or web work, we're pretty specific, use this exact steel. Here, I'm just going to go with the structural steel, which gives me the, the 29 and then 1,000 KSI as my units. So that's going to give me 29 times 10 to the 6 PSI. And then A1 is the cross-sectional area of that. Again, going to this piece um, over here. Whoops. It's not exactly what I wanted to do. It's to just given as one inch by one inch. And the graph actually shows this, or the picture shows this one inch by one inch. So that's a, I'll write it out, but one inch times one inch square. All right, so now we can calculate that. And it should be a pretty small number. So we have 5,000 pounds. You multiply that times four inches. We divide by 29 million PSI. And then we divide by one, so it doesn't change anything. I get um, delta one is 6.897 uh, times 10 to the negative fourth inches. Um, that's a really small number, but a lot of times these changes in length are going to be small. They might be bigger than that, but we have a, a pretty, you know, pretty big one inch diameter, or not diameter, one inch square, uh, four inch long piece of steel that we're applying 5,000 pounds to. So assuming it doesn't fail some other way, it doesn't buckle, uh, it doesn't have a different type of failure, then it would deform a tiny bit. 7 times 10 to the negative 4 inches. Um, but that's only that section, and it got longer. This is a positive number, so that means it, it elongated. All right, then we have to do section 2, where uh, we need to go in the middle of section 2, somewhere here, and open up aluminum. And you can do this a couple of ways. I could either draw the top free body diagram that has the 5,000 steel, 8,000, and a chunk of aluminum, or I could just look at the bottom piece and draw the aluminum with the 3,000 pounds on it. They will both give me the same value. So it doesn't matter in, you know, the bottom one's easier, so let's draw that one. It shows 3,000 pounds pointing upwards here. For this piece to be in equilibrium, I need 3,000 pounds pointing downwards. And when I did that, that made the arrow point towards the little body I drew, which is compression. So here I need to keep track of compressive strains and stresses and changes in lengths. So F2, L2, E2, and A2. For F2, I'm going to put in a negative 3,000 pounds because it's... Uh, compressing this section is actually getting shorter. Um, but it's not 8,000. You know, you got 8,000 pounds sitting on top of the aluminum, um, and that can confuse people who don't draw the free body diagram. They can think, well, there's 8,000 pounds pushing on it. Um, but there's actually only a net of 3,000 pounds pushing on it because you got the 5,000 pulling against the 8,000. So um, it is useful to draw the free body diagrams. The length of section two is given here is five inches tall um, it is given as aluminum so we're going to go over here or I have one aluminum in the chart here I have cast aluminum um, there are other aluminum same deal with the steel where we had multiple and we had to figure out which one um, on an exam problem or a web work problem you're given a very specific one we'll just use this one that says 10.3 million psi So that's 10.3 times 10 to the 6 to get to a million. And then it has a cross-sectional area of uh, 5 inches by 5 inches. So it's much larger. Let's see if we can calculate this number. So 3,000 times five divided by 10.3 or 10.3 times 10 to the six. 
divided by 25. So I get a tiny number, but it's negative also. So negative 5.825 times 10 to the negative fifth inches. All right. Now those two together, delta one is stretching the part, delta two is compressing the part. Um, but if I want to know the change in length from the top of the steel piece where the 5,000 pounds is pointed at applied down to the bottom where it's sitting on the floor, then I have to add these two things together. And that would just be exactly what you think it would be. The total equals delta 1 plus delta 2. Delta 1, 6.897 times 10 to the negative fourth inches plus a uh, negative delta 2, 5.825 times 10 to the negative fifth inches. Uh, the pencil is larger than the compressive, so we'll have a, a net of it get got a little bit longer. So 8 or 6.897 times 10 to the negative fourth plus a negative. 5.825 times 10 to the negative fifth is 6.314, uh, we'll just do that, times 10 to the negative fourth inches. So not a lot, um, but it's a pretty big and short piece. And remember, <coughs> both of those factors, big area makes delta small, short length makes delta small. So um, short, stocky things don't change in length as much as long, skinny things do. So um, there will be certainly be these types of problems on exam one. Um, there'll be a simple version, you know, where it's just a single part. We didn't even do one that had a single part, but, you know, more like that. Um, change in length, you know, really straightforward. And there'll be some like this where you've got stacked parts together and there's different forces being applied and things like that, different materials. You have to add things together. <clears throat> um, but there's probably two of these problems on exam two, one simple one like this or, or similar to this. Um, I wouldn't expect a problem to have more than three sections. Yeah. It's negative because when I drew the free body diagram, the 3,000 pound points towards the body that I drew um, and arrows that point towards the body are compressive and I assign negative signs to compressive forces. And it's so that uh, when I get delta, it makes a smaller length and I'm trying to calculate a change in length and uh, smaller being negative. So negative means it got shorter. Yeah. No, um, so let's do it. Let's do this. Let's say that when we drew this diagram, instead of drawing the bottom half, we draw the top half. So, which I actually is is probably a good thing to do. Um, to since we drew the top half of the first free body diagram, it might make consistent sense to draw the top half of the next free body diagram. It doesn't technically matter, but um, it might make it make more sense. So if I drew the top half, again, I'm not cutting it here, I'm just cutting it through the aluminum piece, then it would look like this. I would have all of the, well, it was four, wasn't it? Yeah, let's try to get it lined up. So I'd have all of the steel section, and then I'd have the top part of the aluminum, then I'd cut through the aluminum, and I'd have 5,000 pounds here, I'd have my 8,000 pounds spread out over this area. And I'd need some force on the inside here towards balance. And what I would need is I would need 3,000 pounds. And don't get confused with the arrow pointing up or down on these diagrams. We're not doing summation of forces in X and Y and Z. We're doing, um, is this a tension or a compressive force? So if the arrow, the 3,000 pound arrow, if it points towards the free body, 
and it does in both cases, then that's a compressive force and I'm going to assign negative signs to compressive forces to differentiate them from tensile forces, which are stretching things, making things longer. Negative compressive forces are shortening things, making them shorter. And so I, that's how I'm telling the difference between elongation and uh, shortening is with the positive or negative sign. So either one of those free body diagrams, are, they're both valid and they both give me the same negative value for 3000. Good. Anything else? All right. So this little guy got a couple of questions. So I thought we would look at it because it's a little bit tricky. Um, not terribly tricky, but a little bit tricky. Um, and it goes back to drawing free body diagrams and the idea that you can draw um, any free body diagram you want, as long as you draw it correctly. <clears throat> so this is mine with my numbers, so it won't work for you and your numbers, but uh, the process would be the same. Um, but this does remind me, I've also gotten questions about the 3D, the last 3D concurrent, or maybe the second to last, second to last 3D concurrent force system where there's a box hanging from some ropes. Um, in web work, web work is very sensitive to decimal places and that particular problem has these three ropes that you need the links of. And I've seen every time that I've answered this question, it's just been rounding. Because if you round those lengths of the rope, that each one of those links shows up three times in the equation. So you have nine rounding errors in that thing. And it can be a tiny, I've seen it as small as uh, a tenth of a pound, or no, four tenths of a pound, you know, a couple of tenths of a pound web work not counting it right versus counting it right. So if that's your problem, don't round, you know, put it in your calculator as a really uh, long number of decimals or put it in MathCAD or something. But um, those lengths of ropes really create problems with that particular problem because they occur so many times in the solution of it. Um, this one doesn't really experience that, but it experiences other problems. So, um, what I would do with this problem, and again, this picture is kind of distorted. Those A and B oval things are actually circles. Um, it doesn't technically make a big difference for what we're doing, but it might make you think some weird things are happening that aren't. Um, so what I would do is I would draw a free body diagram of A, which is a circle. Uh, well, let's actually draw a circle like that. And I would draw a free body diagram of B, which is also a circle. And we're not going to bother to put them in the locations that they are. Oh. Then we would need to add their body weights. So this is A. This is A, by the way. This is B. So body weight for A for me is 92 pounds. Body weight for B for me is 16 pounds. All right. Then we have this unknown tension at an unknown angle between both of them. So T, uh, I have the same tension, but it obviously has to be equal magnitude. So same value of T uh, in the same direction, which I didn't label on here. But to me, that's just given as theta. So both of those are unknowns but they both occur on these free body diagrams. So I can get some overlap, some common things between the two free body diagrams uh, this way. Uh, and then these, whatever they are, does it even say what they are? These weights, these weights are uh, touching the, these inclined planes. Um, so in this class, in this whole course, actually, unless you're given something specific about uh, friction, then we assume that everything's frictionless. So, and this doesn't say anything about friction. So we're gonna assume that there's no friction between the weight and the plane that it's sitting on. So that does only leave the normal force, the perpendicular force. So I'm just gonna draw that here and I'll label it N1. So this is a normal force for part one. And I'll put this kind of over here just to make room for it, N2. And I need an angle on those. And I do know this angle. Um, so 
looking at part A, weight A, it's riding on a plane that's at an angle of alpha measured from horizontal. So if I want to know perpendicular to that, which the normal force in one is perpendicular to that, all I do is say that, well, perpendicular to alpha measured from horizontal is alpha measured from vertical. So all I have to do is put alpha right here, measure it from vertical. Same thing with N2. Um, it's on a plane that's measured beta degrees from horizontal. So if I measure beta degrees from vertical, then that makes N2 perpendicular to that plane. So what I'm doing is basically, you know, there's N2 and it is uh, measured beta from vertical. And here's N1 over here, and it's measured alpha from vertical. <clears throat> so that makes those perpendicular to the planes that they're, they exist on. Um, all right, so now I've got two free body diagrams. I actually know alpha and beta. They gave me those. Uh, alpha is 30 and beta is 60 degrees. All right. So what I would do next is I would take and write the X equation, so summation of forces in X, um, for one and for A, I guess. And that would give me T times the cosine of theta. I don't know either of those numbers, so they're just variables. Um, minus N1, which I don't know N1, but I do know alpha. So minus N1 times the sine of alpha, which is 30 degrees. Those have to add to zero for the X components of weight A to be balanced. Otherwise, weight A is moving in the X direction. And they told me it wasn't, or I assume it wasn't. Um, I would write the same thing for B. And I have negative T times cosine of theta um, plus N2 times the sine of 60 degrees. Those have to add to zero. And then I would do the Y components. So Y for part A would be T times sine theta plus N1 times the cosine of 30 degrees. These don't add to zero. They have to add to the 92 pounds, right? So the two forces, the tensional force in the cable and the normal force in the uh, from the plane need to support the 92 pound weight of the thing. Otherwise, it's sliding down the plane. Um, same thing happens on B where the cable, except the cable is actually going down. So minus T, you know, the weight A is pulling down on it. So minus T times sine of theta uh, plus N2 times the cosine of 60 degrees. Those need to support the 16 pound weight of B. Now I did it this way to, to make a, uh, to set them up a certain way. If, you know, if you just randomly write them out, you may not see this, but if I write them this way, you can see that the X components of A have T cosine theta, and the X components of B have minus T cosine theta. And if I add those two equations together, T cosine theta subtracted from, or, or subtracted T cosine theta is just zero. So I end up with this equation saying N2 sine of 60 degrees plus a negative, that's all right, a negative. Negative, so subtract N1 sine of 30 degrees equals zero. Same thing happens over here. You know, these terms, when I add these two equations together, they subtract one another. So over here, I would end up with N2 cosine of 60 degrees plus N1 cosine of 30 degrees. These don't add to zero, though. They add to 92 plus 16, which is 108 pounds. And now I have two equations with two unknowns. I did have four equations with four unknowns in there, but... The four unknowns, two of them were tied together, like sine of theta and T. So that kind of makes it a difficult thing to deal with. But this, I just have N1 and N2, and I can solve those two simultaneously just with the simple 
uh, matrix or whatever. Solve simultaneously yields uh, N2 equals, I wrote it down, 54 pounds. And N1 equals 93.53 pounds. All right. So now I have two of my variables solved. There's still a little bit of, all right, what do I do now? So go back to um, XA equation and plug this thing in. I get T times cosine of theta minus, now I know what N1 is. I'm, I'm looking at this equation right here. Um, N1 is 93.53 pounds times sine of 30 degrees equals zero, I can actually get a little bit more information from here. Um, 93.53 times sine of 30 is 46.765. So this would say that T equals 46 or yeah 46.765 over cosine of theta so i still don't know t but i have a simple version of t so let's look at y a so this is this is the equation that's actually no that's not it it's, it's uh over here isn't it right there all right so it says that T sine of theta uh, plus N1, which I know is 93.53 pounds, times the cosine of 30 degrees equals, and it's uh, off the screen there, but it's 92 pounds. All right. So I could collapse this down a little bit. T sine theta equals... 92 minus, whoops, 92 minus uh, 93.53 times cosine of 30. 11, a bunch of zeros, and then 6. So we'll just say 11. Web work may not like this because I did round that a little bit, but we'll say 11 pounds. All right. Now a little bit of trig identity trickiness, but let's take this value for T and put it in here. And I get uh, 46.765 over cosine of theta times sine of theta is 11 pounds. And if I look at that a little bit different, 46.765 times sine of theta over cosine of theta equals 11, those are pounds, not Bs. Um, sine of theta over cosine of theta is tangent. So now I finally have something that I can solve. So therefore, I do inverse tangent of 11 over 46.765, and I get theta is 13.24 degrees. I can plug that into web work and see if it likes it. And I can also plug it into one of these equations up here and solve for T. Um, I guess I could even put it in the, the one I have highlighted right there. And I would get uh, T is, for me, I think it's, for, I don't know if I wrote it down, 48.02 pounds. And again, I don't know if WebWork likes these because I did round some, but um, that is the general procedure. Now, these type of problems in WebWork, are meant to you know make you work through and you know how do you get the geometry to work out on exams I'm not expecting this level of like figuring things out in general on the exam multiple choice problems you have about six or seven minutes uh, some of those you should be able to finish in you know one minute or less than one minute for the really simple stuff so that, that you basically stockpile some minutes to work on the longer problems but um, this level is a little bit much for an exam problem. Maybe knowing one of these little deals, like uh, just being able to get to the N2 and N1 values, that might make a 
on a hard um, test question. But on web work, you have you know a lot more time, and so we do put some of these in there to see how you can get through the process of figuring out with it looks like there's just too much stuff unknown. How do I put these four equations into a, a set of equations to solve simultaneously? And sometimes there's other ways to do that. Um, any questions about stuff to this point? No. Oh, all right. Well, I think we're good. You do have a couple of things coming up.